Good morning. Steve Stites, Chief Medical Officer here at the University of Kansas Health System. Delighted to be back with you on this yet again beautiful spring morning here on Tuesday. And we have a great program for you this morning. Of course, Doc Hawk is here, Medical Director of Infection Profession and Control. We are delighted to welcome Kat, Dr. Catherine Satterwhite, the Regional Health Administrator for the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, back into our studio. Mm -hmm. Welcome hi, back, ma'am. Well, always glad to have you with us. And joining us virtually is KDHE Secretary Dr. Lee Norman, who had this position at KU before I was here. And uh, we are always happy to have Lee Norman back. It is, it is the best. So first of all, thanks to you both for your service. I know you guys just do great work and help take care of all of us. So thank you all for the great things that you do. We're going to talk with these two good folks in just mm -hmm. a moment. But first, Hawkeye, yeah, the numbers. what do we got? So Hayes is doing good two total, one active and one recovery. We know around the nation overall the cases are going down, but we've had a few more in Kansas City I over the did, last 24 I hours. We did, yeah, rolling seven day average up to 200 yeah. in Kansas City. Yeah. So, so yeah, like here that. at the hospital right now we have 15 active patients. Okay. Five in the ICU, but four of those on the ventilator. Eleven uh, in that recovery period, so 26. But more concerned about that 15 in that active uh, infection. Yeah, it is a little bit of a bump yeah. up than what we've seen before. Mm -hmm. And I liked it better when, when we were at seven or eight. Yeah. I think we're seeing the effect of people getting together a little bit more. It's a little bit nicer. Yeah. Restaurants getting a little more opened up. Bars, we know that those are places where people go and things like that. And uh, I'm just suspicious that that's what's out there. Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll, we'll see here. We'll talk to Dr. Norman to get his take on that. But I like it when the numbers are even lower. lower. Yeah. yeah, but still a lot of folks vaccinated. Thinking about big news, we expect some new clarification mm -hmm. from the CDC on mass guidance today. What do you think they're going to tell us? Yeah, you know, hopefully, um, I think there will be a delineation between vaccinated and unvaccinated. We hear a lot of people saying, well, what's in it for me if I get vaccinated? Well, I mean, I think there's consideration for your fellow neighbors and countrymen, first of all, and putting yourself ahead and doing that act of charity of getting vaccinated, but also what's in it for you. Individually, we know it decreases, and uh, that's the vaccines. We know they decrease the spectrum of disease, including hospitalization, severe disease, and death. And also data signals that it actually helps reduce uh, transmission of the disease as well. So I think that there will be a delineation between vaccinated and unvaccinated. And then again, in those outdoor spaces, uh, we've always been an advocate for doing things outdoors. We know that it's hard uh, to be exercising and be outdoors, but these are probably going to more of um, kind of gathering places outdoors and can you wear your mask or do you, can you keep it off? So. Look forward to hearing that. The reports coming out of Miami that there is a private school there for um, you know secondary edu or uh, primary education and then uh, uh, middle school, high school, saying that if you've been vaccinated as a teacher, you should not come back to work as you could spread disease. Hmm. I yeah. don't get it. Do you understand? I, I don't understand no, that. I did not see that. I yeah. think that's uh, that's actually counterintuitive and counter to what what we have seen. Yeah. published in the data. Yeah, I think it's when people start making up stuff that yeah. it gets especially dangerous. So, well, let's first see if there are reporter questions out there, although I always know that those reporter questions may lead us to a conversation with either Dr. Satterwhite or Dr. Norman, but let's see what we got. Yeah, hi, this is... Hi, guys, uh, good morning. It's Taylor, Channel 41. Oh. <laughs> All right, Taylor. We'll, we'll get you both, the though. Titans is what just happened there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> So uh, I haven't been on the call in a while, so I apologize if you addressed this already. But I, I talked about this with uh, Doc Hawk this morning a little bit, but I'd like to ask Dr. Norman as well. Um, uh, Senator Roger Marshall was on a, a national program last week. I heard him, he, and he tweeted the video out saying that his understanding and his, his belief, the reason that people are choosing not to get the vaccine is because they don't feel like it's going to change their life in any way for the better uh, in the immediate. They, they're going to have to continue to wear the mask. They're going to have to continue social distancing. And he was making the point that's why he feels like people are not getting the vaccine. I wanted to ask uh, Dr. Mormon, Dr. Norman if he uh, agrees with that assessment and um, what things that you can tell people uh, that are possible once you are fully vaccinated. You've got the second vaccine and you've had the two weeks after. Um, is there anything that you, you should be able to notice different about your own day-to-day uh, -day operations once that's been done? Yeah, the only thing I'll agree with him on, from what you've quoted anyway, is that it's it, it, that we haven't been able to open up more broadly as quickly as everybody would like, but we haven't reached a critical mass of vaccines to, in order to completely discard masks and social distancing and the like. So it's moved a little slower than what we would like. It's still sticking with the evidence and with the science, and 
people should still get vaccinated because that's why it'll it'll end all this sooner the more people get vaccinated. Well, Lee, let's be honest. The only thing you look forward to is not getting a sick, right? You won't be mm-hmm. hospitalized. The, the odds are yeah. you're, you're not going to get hospitalized. You're not going to get a sick. It's going to be more like a small bump in the road as opposed to a major landmine. You're not going to be at risk for post-COVID syndrome. I mean, the idea that we don't know how it's going to be better if we get vaccinated is because people aren't listening. It's not because we haven't been talking. Well, and to be clear, um, there are a lot of reasons that people are reluctant to get vaccinated. Um, Understanding the value is is one thing, the value to the person, the value to society, um, what additional things you can do. But we also know that people still have important questions and it's that they still don't have the confidence and the answers that they need. Um, That sometimes, despite our supply being much better than it was in the beginning, Um, there are still access issues. So it is really a multifactorial issue Mm -hmm. like much of this pandemic has been. Yeah, and I would still say, you know, we know that your risk of getting blood clots, either small blood clots or large blood clots in your legs and in your lungs is one in five. So up to 20 percent of people can get that. We know that that is a very, very small chance with the Johnson & Johnson vaccine or that association, and really none when the mRNA. So you're kind of really protecting yourself against those things. But it's also a lot of the a lot of the people will go ahead and get chemotherapy if they have cancer. Now, again, chemotherapy is a therapeutic. This is a prevention. But we know the horrible things that chemotherapy can do. They can knock down your immune system, you know, lose your hair, have all these other side effects. They'll still go ahead and get the the chemotherapy or they'll get antibiotics, which can cause um, C. diff infection or other side effects for something as simple as a, a viral sinusitis, which antibiotics don't help anyways. But yet they won't get these safe mRNA vaccines, or really even the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, which can help reduce the chance of all those things that you talked about, the long hauler symptoms, blood clots, everything else. So I think we just have to continue to give that message and really want consistent thinking. Um, And everybody who is vaccine hesitant to seek out the true answers and those sources of truth. I think it's also important to remember that we are in this together. And for many of our fellow Americans, they will have diseases that vaccine may not help them as much. So if they've had a blood or bone marrow cancer, if they've had an organ transplant, if they've been on certain medications where their their immune system is really reduced, then they're going to count on the rest of us to help keep Mm -hmm. them safe. And one of the ways we can help do that is to make sure that we're all vaccinated, because when we do that, our risk of spreading disease drops by 90 plus percent. So, you know, again, we are in this together. And the thing we can do to lead ourselves back to a more normal life is to be vaccinated. You know, Sunday night, out to dinner with six friends, right? Well, my wife and uh, and four other folks, five other folks. And, you know, we're sitting outside, we're talking outside, Mm -hmm. and you just feel totally safe. Everybody Mm -hmm. had been vaccinated. I think that was a really safe event outside. Mm -hmm. And I think I felt so much more comfortable. I would not have done that if we hadn't all been Mm -hmm. vaccinated. I would not have felt comfortable if I had not been vaccinated. So I think you can feel a lot more secure in your life. I think you can get much more more back, much more back to normal. But we also have to get a lot of people vaccinated in order to really accomplish getting ourselves all the way back to normal. We can see what's happening in India and other places Mm -hmm. where folks started taking off their mask, reduced social distancing, went back to normal, and didn't have vaccination. So those are not the outcomes we want to achieve here in the United States. There's another question out there. Yeah, hi. This is uh, John Shorman at The Star. Hey, John. uh, Hey, probably for Dr. Norman today. Um, But... uh, if you look at the county by county vaccination rates in Kansas for uh, fully vaccinated individuals, uh, it looks like there's about a close to a 20 point spread right now between the most and least vaccinated counties. I'm kind of wondering if that kind of gap continues and isn't closed, uh, how is life going to look and feel different this summer in high vaccinated areas versus lower vaccinated areas? I guess, in other words, what are the consequences? What are the consequences for that kind of spread uh, persisting as, as we move forward here? Yeah, <clears throat> good question, John. <clears throat> I think the bottom line reflects back to what Steve Stites just said, and that is that the higher vaccinated counties are going to have less disease and less impact, and the local uh, authorities, elected authorities, will be able to kind of open up and relax things quicker. We do pay a lot of attention to those county by county uh, discrepancies in terms of the administration rate. And we are doing um, a less overall of mass vaccination clinics now and are going more and more to smaller, more mobile um, uh, clinics. And and then as we get more and more vaccine into private offices, 
it's it's kind of playing the small game in a sense of getting out into pockets and populations that are harder to reach. I might use this, uh, Dr. Stites, as an opportunity to mention on our website, we have a new functionality, uh, the Social Vulnerability Index uh, Explorer, SBI Explorer. And that looks at uh, people that uh, of different socioeconomic races, equi uh, uh, ethnicities and the like, and then talks about county by county, the rates of testing and um, vaccine in those areas. So what we're doing is putting under a microscope we want to make sure that we reach all people in all counties. And uh, there's still a lot of work to be done. And interestingly, a lot of information emerging on the difference uh, in the race between men and women. There's a huge disparity between men and women choosing to get vaccinated also. Yeah, I think that sounds like a really important tool yeah. to take a look at. Kat, Dr. Sato, I thought that you might Yes, um, I've seen this tool, and I do think it's it's a great tool, and I would encourage everyone to go look at it. Um, I'd also just like to take a moment to um, give a shout out to Dr. Norman and the public health team across the state of Kansas. Uh, they have done a tremendous job at adapting to this vaccine at, at many times, um, including really getting to a really hard place where we are right now, where we have seen a lot of people who really wanted that vaccine mm -hmm. go ahead and get it, mm -hmm. including a lot of women. Um, mm -hmm. But we do have a lot of people who haven't gotten the vaccine, and now we're in a place that it's harder. We do have to increase the access points and look at the smaller model, which is how we generally disseminate vaccines. So how do we shift from this pandemic response to more of a steady state operation where we have vaccine available in a lot of places, where we have trusted community members informing their peers, their networks, um, where we have people talking to their primary care provider and able to get a vaccine on site there. So thank you, Dr. Norman, and all the public health workers across Kansas, whether you're working for a local health department or another organization that's partnering to keep people safe. Um, I am greatly appreciative. Well, Dr. Norman, she is much nicer to, to you than I'm going to be. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to take that. Nobody so that surprises no one. <laughs> And so, he always has been. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, it's funny to me where we still have to have conversations about vaccination. Because you think about how successful mm -hmm. things have been around polio and influenza mm -hmm. and other things when you get vaccinated. And you look at this and you step back and you're like, why is this such a fight? And honestly, why is it such a fight between um, uh, even red states and blue states? Mm -hmm. And why are things so mm -hmm. politicized around it? And why can't everyone embrace the science and the knowledge that we've been being vaccinated for so many years in so many different ways? Yeah. You know, I think the other thing I hear, it's happened too fast. Mm -hmm. We're just, it's, you know, it went on too fast. You sit back, you look, really? The development of this vaccine is on the backs, Hawkeye, of vaccines mm -hmm. for generations, mm -hmm. right? I mean, the polio vaccine, the influenza vaccine, the MMR, I mean, so many vaccines. And we've learned so much mm -hmm. that we're just kind of getting on the back of those vaccines and going forward. Mm -hmm. And this messenger RNA vaccine has been around for over a decade. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they've been using this platform for a while. They are hoping to expand it to other diseases as well. And I, th I think a lot of it goes to um, a lot of people don't understand and, and haven't had to see their children sick from those vaccine preventable diseases like measles, mumps, and rubella, so they don't understand the impact of disease. Obviously, for this, we have. But I think to your, uh, to your words and your point about the speed, well, I think really what is combating the, the speed is it's just been expedited because they've had unlimited resources to go about it. Doing these trials and developing this uh, costs a lot of money. So a lot of companies, especially smaller companies, are not able to do it or in a quick manner. But when you have all of the resources and the money behind it, you can expedite those trials. You can still do it in a safe manner. And that's what we've seen done. Yeah, I think that's a great point. How much a difference it made to open up with warp speed. And mm -hmm. I think we got to give the Trump administration credit on this. Operation Warp Speed was yeah. really important because it funded things that otherwise companies and entrepreneurs would have had to spend generations into try you know years and years trying to find mm -hmm. the money to yeah. finance that trial and hope they had it. And I mean a perfect example of that is SARS was being investigated but it died out so funding ran out for developing therapeutics and vaccine for that. MERS still is going on in the Arabian Peninsula, but it affects very few people every year. So there's not a big need of it, especially in Western countries. So there's just no money, there's no funding for it. But what you have when this pandemic is affecting the whole world, you will have all of the attention and all the resources going towards looking at therapeutics and prevention such as vaccines. And that's what we've seen. All right, let me just try, are there any other reporter questions? 
So Friday, the Kansas Department of Health and Environment opened its border for vaccinations. Thank you, by the way. The great call. Kansas joins more than 20 other states that have been opted to give the shot to anyone, anywhere who wants one. Dr. Norman, what led to that decision? Besides just doing the right thing, well done, by the way. <laughs> well, thanks. Um, <clears throat> and, and I assure you that Governor Kelly took no arm twisting to agree with our public health recommendation to do that. Um, and quite honestly, uh, and Dr. Satterwhite pointed this out, we're in a better place in terms of supply and demand uh, where we knew we could accommodate it. Uh, anytime appointments are going unfilled, we see that as a lost opportunity. The virus doesn't give a hoot about what their state of residence is. Um, I saw in North Dakota, I read this a couple of weeks ago, and I uh, about North Dakota was immunizing Canadian truckers because they're coming in from a country that is very low amount of vaccination going on. And it was uh, enlightened self-interest for North Dakota who said, you know, we don't, truckers can bring in uh, virus too, so let's immunize those guys, those men and women. So uh, I think it's pragmatic. Uh, the states around us are doing the same thing, and I think it'll just pencil out. We have enough vaccine to do that. Yeah, it sounds like exactly the right I, thing, I right? I think the other thing to that, too, is this is a very much a first world problem. Look at India. You mentioned that in, in the opening statements. They would give anything to have the glut of vaccines that we have right now to protect themselves, their loved ones, and their country. And, um, you know, we have the ability to do that, and we have all these open slots for vaccination. So we have to continue to people to, con uh, to encourage people to continue to fill up those slots for vaccine. Yeah, it's, it is amazing that in March we were talking about people who are trying to lie, cheat, and steal in order to get a vaccine, and mm -hmm. now we're trying to go find arms to give up. We have 14,000 doses of vaccine to give, people, 14,000. There's only one way for us to give that. We need your arms. Dr. Satterwhite, the president has asked all states to lift age and different phase restrictions in, across the country. Mm -hmm. How does that, along with opening up the borders or anywhere, how does that help us get more vaccine into people? It's really, it's really access. Um, you know, just like now in Kansas City, the state line doesn't matter. That is happening all over the country. Again, the better prepared we are as a healthcare delivery system, as a public health delivery system, to facilitate people getting a vaccine anywhere, anytime they want, um, the better we are going to be able to respond to somebody when they make that important decision to get vaccinated. Um, so. The more we knock down those barriers, the better it is for not only a city like Kansas City, but for our whole country. It just keeps everybody safe, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So my next question. So are you all comfortable with the J&J &J vaccine? Are you ready to go? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. If I hadn't been already vaccinated, I would absolutely go get it. Dr. Norman, thoughts? Well, I agree. Uh, that's, you know, we, we started it back up again starting today, as a matter of fact. Uh, we put out the um, modified um, information to be provided to cl clinicians and to people receiving the vaccine. Uh, we wouldn't have done that if it, we didn't feel like the safety profile, the risk benefit profile was uh, far in the benefit side of the equation. So uh, yeah, go get the vaccine. It's, it's, a, it's a successful vaccine. We don't, <clears throat> we don't have that much of it. We're going to get, I think, 1,700 doses uh, the week of May 3rd. So we're, it's not like we're flush in it. Um, and for people who want to get vaccinated, I wouldn't put off the Pfizer and Moderna if they're content with that and go get that. I, uh, but we will get more of J and J coming down the road. You know, I just I, 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 we've said yesterday in the program, we said it before, if we didn't have Pfizer and Moderna, we would be a gog over how great the J and J vaccine was, mm -hmm. right? That's I mean, it really is incredibly successful. Mm -hmm. It's just you got Pfizer and Moderna out here who have just been rocking it, and and uh, that's a pretty it's, important. It's been so long since we first saw those numbers that mm -hmm. came out, and I yeah. just remember the shock and awe of how well they worked, and just yeah. it blowing any expectation that I had. Yeah, it's, it is remarkable. But there's still this question of vaccine hesitation. I think we have some clips from an HHS campaign video from the Can from Kansas and others. Um, what other efforts do we have? What, what's being made, made out there as we look at a few of these clips, Dr. Satterwhite? So uh, we at HHS are really trying to figure out how we can encourage people to, again, come together to open up as a society to protect each other, to protect ourselves. So there's been a new campaign released. Um, it's really centered around this idea that we can do it. Um, so there's lots of videos out there. There are social media materials out there. Um, it's a campaign that we really want people to um, use if you can. Um, so there's plenty of materials out there on the web. This goes along with what I mentioned last time I was on um, this show, which is the COVID-19 Community Corps. And that's really, again, empowering um, local 
thought leaders, just local community members to get educated themselves so that they can be a resource for others in their community. So between these two things, um, we're really trying to take it to that next phase where um, we, we collectively can do it together. Yeah, that, 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 that's impressive. And you've got a great mm -hmm. emphasis here on diversity and inclusion in order to make sure that we get to all communities, I think. Absolutely. At least the, the, the yes, thank you for pointing that out. Mm -hmm. And so, also, just one other thing, that please. one of the, the other things that we keep bumping against um, is, is actually one of the reasons that people are a little hesitant to get the vaccine sometimes is there's still lack of clarity that the vaccine is free. You don't have to have insurance. You do not have to pay out of pocket. Mm. Um, there are still populations that we're hearing who ha are a little uh, unclear that it is free for everyone, no matter what. That is really good. That Great is point. true. We're not charging for it, mm. but um, your arm, we need the arm, right? Mm -hmm. There is that still an ongoing <laughs> yeah. call to arm. Okay, so Dr. Norman, Dr. Satterwhite, Dr. Uh, Hawkeye here. What yeah. do we think the CDC is going to say today? What do you think? How, how is my mass guidance going to shift, Lee Norman? Well, um, I've learned I don't predict the weather and I don't necessarily predict what everybody's going to say, but um, I do think that there's going to be some forgiveness um, uh, about people who have been vaccinated. I think there'll be guidance about outdoors um, and a more liberalization of what people can do outdoors. Uh, I think that we still have to focus a lot on a couple of things. One, a mask is always your friend. And um, just if there's a more liberal uh, guidance, but you're in an area that you don't feel comfortable, wear a mask. Um, nobody's going to uh, rip it off you just because of the guidance changes. So I think we're going to see a little bit of liberalization, particularly outside and, uh, and in, with vaccinated people. Okay. Dr. Satterway, prediction? Um, so no predictions, but I want to highlight, first of all, I'm very excited to see what they come out with because I do know that CDC is constantly considering um, the science mm -hmm. and what makes sense given where we are with disease burden, which will get better if everybody vaccinates. The other thing I really want to highlight is just because we're really, really focused on vaccination doesn't mean the other things aren't still important. If you have symptoms, please get tested. Um, we are really encouraging people to consider that spectrum of prevention and um, secondary prevention where if you have symptoms or you, you need to get screened. So please don't hesitate to get tested. Um, it's something really important, particularly with kids, um, because we actually know that they are not eligible to be vaccinated just yet, though hopefully soon. Mm -hmm. That'll be exciting. What do you think is going to happen indoors, guys? What, what are we going to say? If you've been vaccinated indoors, what can you do? What do you think, Hawk? You know, I'm not sure there's going to be any change in the guidance indoors. They just did um, put out some new uh, guidance for vaccinated people for indoors. And again, that was um, being able to get together with one household that is not vaccinated, um, provided there aren't any people that are vulnerable or in that vulnerable population in that household. But vaccinated people can get together. And remember, these are for social situations, not the workplace. So I'm not clear if there's going to be any indoor change to the guidance just yet, but, but we'll see. Okay. Well, Jill, let's get to some questions from the community. All right. Jenna has a question for Dr. Norman, and this is about wastewater and testing. Mm -hmm. Does the COVID wastewater testing align with the significant decrease in positive testing rate indicating spread is lower? Mm -hmm. Or is it still high, indicating that we are not getting enough testing completed? All right. Mm. How are we doing? Um, you know, it's a really good question, first off. Uh, one, the wastewater, um, if there's an increase or a decrease in the wastewater amount of uh, virus, it uh, precedes what we see in the community by about a week or 10 days. So it's a pretty good predictor. Um, the And <clears throat> this last week, we to Steve uh, Stites' earlier point, we have seen a slight uptick in the um, number of cases. Uh, we're currently in Kansas, 3.7% positive testing. And we've seen that same bump about 10 days ago. I met with the, with the KU engineers on this topic just last week. And uh, it's still been a very consistent, not only for the uh, total disease burden, but also for the, the variants of concern that we can now measure and gen genomically sequence out of the wastewater. Are you seeing more variants, Dr. Norman, especially the B117? Yeah, we're seeing more of everything. We still have less than um, a lot of other states. It's it's t remarkable to me how the experiences around are dramatically different around the country. But um, they they still do not predominate in our region yet. But as we do more and more testing, we're picking up more and more. So uh, I, I suspect it'll uh, become more and more the the dominant strain. It's of what percentage is uh, is a variant of some so sort, and what percentage is the wild type? They about. 
the, the, the variants of concern add up to about 50% and the wild strain uh, about 50%. Okay, so there are out there clearly are a lot of variants out there, and let's just say the vaccine's working for those of us who have been vaccinated. We have a doctor that wrote in and wants to know what you think about eye protection when we might mm. be able to go away from wearing that. Hawk, what do you think about eye protection? Yeah, I'm in the hospital. I wouldn't at this point in time. Right. I think it's too early to say. The same thing as masking. I wouldn't do that. In, again, in the hospital, in, in the healthcare setting. Um, I certainly wouldn't do it for flights either um, or any travel, whether that's a train or bus. You know, social situations, again, don't really wear eye protection uh, in those situations, such as going to the store or especially being outdoors. So um, don't have any other uh, comments on when do we think eye protection can go away. And I don't know if he means in social situations or on travel or in the, the healthcare setting, but I would say probably not in the healthcare setting, especially. Um, if you are doing exams, if you're an eye doctor, a surgeon, anything like that, where you're going to be especially close to the patient. Yeah, I, I kind of like my eye protection when I'm doing my lung exam on patients mm -hmm. and things. So it does help. Take a deep breath, blow out hard. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, well, give me where are my goggles. <laughs> Good point. Uh, Jan wants to know just to clarify, can a visiting relative from out of state receive the J and J vaccine while here? Um, Dr. Roman, I don't know mm, if we can specify the J&J &J vaccine, but you could start your immunization, immunization while you're here. Yeah, they, uh, they absolutely can. They can be from out of country, actually. We have a lot of uh, long-term workers from other countries. We have students from other countries, and certainly anybody from any state can get any one of the three vaccines. Now, they might have to get in line for the J&J, &J, uh, but uh, yes is the, is the short answer to the question. Patricia wants to know, how is Wyandotte County doing on vaccinations? What percentage of people have been vaccinated? I, mean, I don't know the Wyandotte County data specifically. Do either of you do, Dr. Norman? Do you know the Wyandotte County data? Do you have maybe at your fingertip there? I do not have it at my fingertip. I know that they have an excess number of appointments um, and therefore are being very, very aggressive in a good way uh, to getting vaccines into arms. So, uh, But they, they've just run an exemplary program in, in Wyandotte, but I don't have that number off the top of my head. I'll second we that. It's on our think, website. And Vibrant Health is out there now doing a lot of it. Mm -hmm. And if you'll give us a moment, we can try and research that question because it's on the New York Times website. You can find it by county in Kansas. So give it a minute. I'll, I'll, we'll try and take a look. Debbie says, we all remember the pictures of Lake of the Ozark parties a year ago with summer coming up soon. Would an event like that now be considered a super spreader? Well, I think it only depends about entirely on what the dynamics are of that. That's a hard question to answer. Right. What type of infection it is, how many people in that have been vaccinated, and how many people have been sick before. A, a super spreader event starts with a single infected individual. Um, so if, if we reduce the overall infection rate in the population, it's less likely to be a super spreader event. However, we do know that there are a range of risk levels for different events, mm -hmm. ranging from low risk, you know, some of the, mm -hmm. the new CDC yeah. guidance where we talk about two vaccinated households getting together, very low risk event for mm -hmm. transmission. And then, yes, um, the more people there are, um, the closer they are, the higher risk the event is to have some level of spread. Yeah, I think directly to your point, the density of people in those pictures was quite high, um, pretty close to each other, definitely not six feet apart, uh, but certainly closer than that. And I think when you're doing that, um, you probably also would assume that there was probably more than one person infected in that high, densely populated area. So um, I, I think that would still be higher risk. But again, if we can get vaccinated, that's going to reduce the risk even more. Looks like Wyandotte County has had 22% of the population having been fully vaccinated for uh, for coronavirus. So, All right. Yeah, there you you go. get the prize. Click ah, on the trigger. Yeah, New York Times. Terry wants to know, if there are going to be certain privileges for those who are vaccinated, how are we going to be able to prove or disprove mm -hmm. we are vaccinated if there are no requirements for a vaccine card? Yeah. What do you think about that, Great Dr. Norman? We are not going to uh, pursue vaccine passports, quote unquote, uh, in the state of Kansas, no intention to, to, to do that. You won't know if somebody's vaccinated or not. You know, sometimes people don't tell the truth. And uh, so you have to kind of make the assumption that uh, some people uh, will uh, not be vaccinated. So we're, we're not going to pursue the passport in the state of Kansas. I would also add that um, when thinking about evaluating your risk um, and thinking about is somebody vaccinated or not, it's, it's also worth considering what other things are going on. Um, do you need to wear your mask? Do you need a distance? So it's really taking all of those things into account that should help guide your, your decisions about what you need to do to be safe. 
Okay, and I know that um, Dr. Stites, do you still have a heart out today? I do, I do. All right. Let's keep going. So, one more minutes, question. Gina please. wants to know how do you find out where the J and J vaccine is if you are wanting to get that vaccine? Is that listed mm -hmm. anywhere? Dr. Norman, how can I get it? The uh, I don't believe it's teased out anywhere. The I think the uh, the vaccinefinder.org is the best place to find the uh, sites uh, within a a radius of your house or your zip code um, and uh, there you go and I think the best way to do it is to call up those vaccinating sites and find out if they have it or not but vaccine finder is a good place to start because you can filter by vaccine type um, the data are as current as we can make them they're not perfect but it is definitely a good tool all right Let's see, first of yeah. all, a couple thoughts about tomorrow. Anil Gallmark, a long hauler, and his pulmonologist, Dr. Leslie Spikes, are going to be back. So bring your questions around the long haul syndrome. Lots of data is still out there about long haul and how serious that is. Dr. Norman, final thoughts about today. Uh, well, I think it's really, we've hit a real good cadence with vaccine administration in Kansas. We're going to hit 2 million doses this week in 20 weeks. Uh, do the math, that's 100,000 doses a week. Remember where we started with 40,000 doses a week coming into the state. So we had to play some catch up um, as we got more and more vaccine. But two, two million uh, doses in 20 weeks is nothing to sneeze at, 100,000 doses a week. So good job, Kansas. We still have a long ways to go, uh, but it's a great start. We do have a long ways to go. We need to get everybody fully vaccinated because I really want to get back to the Royals and the Chiefs mm -hmm. at full throttle. Dr. Satterwhite. Um, just to build on Dr. Norman's comments, I'm thrilled that we have J&J &J in our toolbox again. Um, while supply is low, it's a really important tool for us. We do know that some people really do want J&J, &J, though we still encourage you to get the first available vaccine. Um, we understand that sometimes you really want that. So it's great to have that, tool that back in the toolbox. Um, I'm thrilled at the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practice and CDC's thorough safety review. And I'm um, excited to hopefully get more people vaccinated. Hawkeye. Okay. Yeah, you know, we saw that um, Kansas City will be lifting some restrictions soon. Um, again, I think that that's um, difficult to say uh, as to what's going to happen after that. Uh, but we know that there is a, uh, a collision course or there is competing uh, aspects of this with the optimal medical and public health guidance, and that's what we try to give every day. And then, of course, there are economic uh, things to consider, and also there's the will of the people and what people are willing to stand for. But the way that we can continue to give the optimal medical and public health guidance and protect people uh, is by doing these three things, and that's vaccination. We know vaccination can protect you individually from severe disease, hospitalization, and death, but also your risk of long-haul symptoms blood clots, things of that nature, but it can also help protect other people because we believe that there is good data that suggests that you have a reduction in transmission of the disease. The other thing is masking, continue to mask. We know that the masks provide a barrier for you if you are ill uh, from expressing the virus into the environment and also provides protection for you, the wearer as well. Uh, the other thing is distancing. We know that distancing is better, especially outdoors is a lot better than indoors. Uh, other things that contribute is hand hygiene on a regular basis, on a daily basis. Overall, that is just good for your health. So doing those types of things, we can move forward and continue to get back towards things like they were in 2019, as opposed to things like they were in 2020. Wow, you guys have all said it pretty darn well. Um, what I want to just point out is we have 14,000 doses, mm -hmm. and I can make up a song about 14,000 mm -hmm. based on the 582,600 minutes from rent, but I'm not going wow. to do that because it may hurt your ears. <laughs> but I want you to come give us your arm, not your ears on this one. Use my chart to make an appointment. If you're already a patient for us, you can go right there and make your appointment to get a vaccine. We can do it today. Um, also, if you're not one of our patients, you can go to kansashealthsystem.com backslash vaccine or whomever, if you're not real internet savvy and that's a lot of us just call 913-588-1227 we're going to get you signed up because you know we want to beam into the future we want to make sure that we can take the advantage of operation warp speed to go to operation return to normal so let's be can bkc as we said at the beginning of this show we can master this you think we've got 40 or 50 percent of the people who have had one dose of vaccine so far 10 or 20 percent of people, maybe more, have, been, have had coronavirus. We may be getting 60 or 70 percent. That's a good number, folks. We can do this. We can keep each other safe. We can keep yourself safe. We can keep our world safe. But it takes one thing. It takes your arm. It takes a needle. Together, we can do it. We'll see you tomorrow.
I got the COVID vaccine, and you know what? I'm glad I did. But I'll, I'll be honest with you. I was hesitant. I kept hearing the vaccine was rushed and might be unsafe. So I decided to ask my doctor because I trust my doctor. My doctor gave me the answers I needed to make the right choice to keep me and everyone I love safe. When it comes to the COVID vaccine, please talk to your doctor. 